Our fearless Sorry leader about, has arrived. Sorry about that. I uh, everybody hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, I uh, when I was setting this up, I I accidentally set up two different meetings. So uh, I was in the other one and was like, nobody's there. That stinks. <laughs> well, well, good morning. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining today. We're going to uh, get started, and uh, if you have any questions while we're going through the uh, the two topics today of uh, proving and uh, sampling setup in the Flow computer, just uh, uh, let us know, raise your hand, uh, speak out, and uh, we will try to answer the questions best we can. Uh, at the end of this, we're going to uh, process this video, and we'll put it up online in our YouTube channel and, and provide the links and everything, so you'll be able to access this at later times if need be. Um, so this is part of our series of advanced flow computers, and uh, what we're trying to do with this is offset uh, training that uh, customers would normally come to for advanced training, and we're breaking it up over the course of the year and providing different topics, whether it's on uh, FlowX advanced training or Omni Advanced Training, and then these sessions are all recorded and they're made up online um, for your usage. And you'll see these every month, we'll be sending out announcements about these. So we may change formats. Um, we're thinking about going to uh, doing something where we're doing a multicast stream on YouTube and LinkedIn. So if we do that, of course, you'll get announcements uh, for that as well. So, and if you have any ideas for any other topics that you'd like to discuss or like to have more information about, just let us know. And uh, we'll try to uh, create a, a schedule for that and put it on our training list. So with that, uh, a brief introduction. My name is Brent Palmer. I'm with CRT Services, and I am the uh, flow computer uh, or measurement uh, technology manager. So uh, I, my group, uh, we work with flow computers specifically, and uh, we help uh, installation, troubleshooting, and, and all that. So um, we're here to answer any questions that you guys have, help with installations, help with uh, uh, questions on uh, different topics as well. If it's this flow computer or another flow computer, uh, just give us a shout and we'll, uh, we'll do what we can to try to answer the questions on those, but we have a, a lot of good people um, with a lot of experience on flow computers uh, working at CRT and uh, we're here to help support and answer questions. So with that, uh, let's get started. And I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen and hopefully uh, everybody will be able to see the initial uh, presentation I'm going to do, which is a, uh, a very short power present PowerPoint presentation. But with the PowerPoint presentation, what we try to do is uh, make sure that everybody has the, the same understanding of uh, what's going on with technology. And uh, that way we can uh, start with uh, proving and uh, we're all coming from the same background. We know how it works and therefore the configuration settings are going to make a lot more sense as we're going through. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, like I said, I'll go ahead and share my screen with you and then hopefully everything on here will display properly. And let me just bring the PowerPoint over and we'll start that back up. And Ken, I'll ask you for some feedback if you don't mind. Um, yeah, if ever's good. Okay, perfect. So we'll go over proving. Um, so with proving, what are we trying to do with that? Uh, well, with proving, if my slide actually advances, for liquid proving, um, what we're doing is we're physically testing the performance of the, the meter and liquid service. What we're trying to do is assure the accuracy of the meter. And the basic principles in liquid proving are the same, whether it's a Coriolis meter, turbine meter, positive displacement meter, or ultrasonic meter. Meaning what we're proving, what we're doing is we're basically, we're counting pulses and that pulses equals a either a volume or a mass and then we're comparing that against the volume or mass of the prover to try to determine the accuracy of the meter and you'll see how we do that so there's a few different provers that are common to the industry the the first one that you see is a uh, ball prover and ball provers can be both uh, unidirectional and bidirectional so in this case i have a ball prover then that ball prover has a four-way valve and the hey, ball is going to travel yeah yeah, we're not, it's not, uh, your slides aren't advancing. I'm still, oh. stuck. I still see the first line. Okay, let me switch screens then. I think it just might be that I'm on the wrong screen. screen. Uh, let's see. Is everybody else seeing the same thing I'm seeing? 
We'll get out of that real quick. There it goes. And, uh, okay. Now I see the ball. Yeah, but the it, pipe prunes. Okay. Okay. So with this ball prover, uh, basically we have a ball and that ball is going to uh, start off in a launch chamber. The four way valve is basically going to switch directions. We're going to push the ball through. We're going to hit some detector switches going in the forward and then we'll reverse the direction, come in the reverse and then we'll count the number of pulses forward, the number of pulses reverse, and this will equal a, a proving run. Now, the each time we go forward and come reverse, that's considered a pass, and we can have multiple passes in a run. So I can basically say, well, go forward, come reverse, go forward again, come reverse, and all the volume that you've counted from detector to detector, count that as one pass or one run. So I can build multiple passes into a run. And we do that a lot with uh, um, when a prover becomes a small volume prover. So um, the small volume provers, basically, you have multiple uh, uh, choices for a small volume prover because a piston prover or ball prover isn't a small or large volume prover based upon the fact that it's a ball or a piston prover. You're a small or large volume prover based upon can that prover produce enough counts in its volume, meaning that from detector one to detector two, when I start counting, will that meter's K factor and the volume that I move through that prover be enough to generate 10,000 pulses? So if I'm just going forward with this and I launch, and at the end of my launch, when I hit first detector and then hit the second detector, if I'm able to count 10,000 pulses, then that prover can be determined to be a uh, large volume prover. If it can't, then it's a small volume prover. And there's some other things that I have to do. And we'll get into that when we look at some of the piston provers. But in theory, I could have two meters on here, a turbine meter with, let's say, a K factor of 2000 pulses per barrel. And the volume of this prover with that turbine meter is going to allow me to reach over 10,000 pulses. But then I have another meter that goes through this prover as well. But let's say it's a helical meter where I have a K factor of only 17 pulses per barrel. Well, that's not going to give me 10,000 pulses from detector one to detector two. So now this prover, which is a large volume prover for one type of meter or, or one size of meter, can now be a small volume prover. And again, there's some things we have to do with turning on double chronometry and pulse interpolation, and I'll show those in a second. But staying on the ball prover, what happens is when this ball comes through, we hit a uh, detector switch. And this detector switch basically sitting in the pipe has the sphere come through and it pushes up a plunger, which then pushes up a probe and in turn makes a contact. The flow computer sees that and determines that it's seen a detector switch. And if we break down that switch a little bit more, you'll see that there's an O-ring because you've got to isolate the plunger. Actually, this probe sticks through down into the pipe. So uh, there's a lot of components to this, but something that affects the volume of the prover when this prover is water drawn and they determine the volume is how far does that probe stick down into the pipe? Because what can happen is if I have to change this probe out, I have to change the switch out and I have to do something to the probe and that probe then extends a little bit further or it doesn't extend as far into the pipe as what it did when it was water drawn, then where it makes contact on that ball is different. That in turn will change the volume of the prover. So we need to be aware that when we're changing out detector switches on uh, ball provers that we can drastically affect the volume of them depending on how they're reinserted. And I may have to rewater draw this prover. So the other thing that can happen is as this ball is traveling past this detector switch, it can travel at such a high velocity that that switch will vibrate. It'll slap basically when the ball goes through. So it'll bounce up real quick because it, it saw the ball. And then when it comes down, it'll hit and bounce up a little bit and hit again. And it can cause a false detection coming in. So we uh, we have some settings in there that we're able to ignore any what we call detector uh, slap or detector um, uh, of false settings or false uh, witnesses to it. And we can put a delay in there that says, hey, if we see the detector switch, then we'll ignore for X amount of seconds the next detector switch coming in uh, to make sure we don't see that slap. 
The other type of provers that we deal with are small volume provers or see, I still call them small volume provers, but we deal with um, piston provers. And this is one manufacturer of piston provers. There's a few of them, uh, FlowMD, Honeywell, MagnaProve, uh, Brooks. They uh, they all make a piston prover. They all have uh, a little variation on what they're doing with it, how they're pulling the piston back and the control mechanisms behind it. But uh, for the most part, they use optical switches instead of using mechanical switches. So the optical switches, um, what happens is when they hit, this isn't a ball, when the ball displacer hits a detector switch, it starts a pulse train and we start counting pulses. The same thing happens um, with a piston prover. The piston prover, basically, when we issue a launch, that piston drags backwards and then the flow takes that forward. But we've got a flag here and it's going to hit the optical switches. Now these optical switches won't bounce. So what happens is we draw this back, we hit the first flag B, we draw back, we hit A, then we release, the poppet closes on the piston, and then we hit first flag, which is A, and we start counting pulses, we hit B, and we stop counting pulses. So we, you can see we start and stop counting these pulses, and that will give us our pulse count. We have a K factor. We look at the number of pulses that was from A to B. We determine the volume and we compare it, that against the known volume of the measured section of the prover. And we look and we see what our meter factor is for our first run or deviation is for our first run. So we're going to get into more detail on this, but I just kind of wanted to give you a, an example of, of how both of these devices work and, and some of the things that happen within there. We're going to go over pulse interpolation, but pulse interpolation basically is a way that when we can't get 10,000 pulses from the flow meter, which gives us an uncertainty of 0 0.01 in the volume of our approver, then we have to turn on pulse interpolation. And pulse interpolation, the most common method is double chronometry. And what double chronometry allows is the gathering of less than 10,000 pulses, while the flow meter uncertainty is still in the, uh, the 0.01%. And it does that by starting this double chronometry, which is a measurement of time between the start and stop signals and the time between the two meter pulses that immediately follow the start and stop signal. So you start a couple different uh, stopwatches, basically, and then we come up with the pulse interpolated time, and then we apply that and come up with a uh, with the uh, total pulse count that's interpolated to 10,000 pulses. So what we'll see on a proven report when, and this is a typical proven report, but when I look at these runs and you can see the data from run one, I have a total count of 1418. If I have a whole pulse count, then I know that I'm not using pulse interpolation or double chronometry. It's when I have pulse counts that are in the tens and hundreds. In addition, then I know double chronometry or pulse interpolation is turned on. So the other thing we're doing is we're looking at what is the deviation between these runs and we're trying to come up with a maximum deviation. Typically we want 0.05% between the runs when we're doing five runs. And that's just API saying, I want an uncertainty of 0.02027. So what that means is when I look at API chapter 4.8, which dictates the, uh, the repeatability method, there's an appendix in there. And that appendix basically says, well, I'm trying to meet a repeatability of 0 0.00027, uncertainty of my meter factor. So if I do five proving runs and I put my repeatability at 0.05% and those proving runs come in, with the with the repeatability of less than 0.05 percent, my meter factor uncertainty is 0 0.00027 or 0.027 percent. But statistically, if I was to do 17 runs and my repeatability came point, with a 0.19 percent, I'm still at the same uncertainty of my meter factor. So this allows us to use uh, Chapter 4.8 in the flow computer and basically allow for uncertainty proving and we can say hey i want my uncertainty instead of doing it by repeatability i want my uncertainty to be 0.027 percent 
and then I'll put in a maximum number of runs, let's say of 20 runs, and the flow computer will run. And as long as it meets you, it meets that uncertainty within three runs, it can stop if it's uncertainty is 0 0.0027, or if the repeatability is 0 0.02, because it's the same uncertainty. Or the, the reverse happens is I'll keep on running and go out to 16 runs, even if the repeatability comes at 0 0.18, that's still the same uncertainty. So you're able to turn this on and off within the flow computer. And I just wanted to give a little explanation of what that what that setting actually means. So are, are there any questions on proving? I didn't cover master meter proving. Um, there's not a lot of people doing master meter proving, but the flow computer does have the ability to do master meter proving, which is basically I have a meter, which is a master meter, and then I'm gonna put it in series with my primary meter and I'm going to start counting the pulses and stop counting the pulses on both those meters at the same time and then I'm going to compare the volumes and treat that as a run so master meter that's kind of the same thing that's what it's doing but are there any questions that I can answer on proving so far all right perfect that's it for powerpoints so let's get into the flow computer and what I have is Flow Express open. And in Flow Express, what I've done is I've set up the ability to share this prover or connect to a remote prover. And we do that by uh, a little peer to peer connection. So in Flow Express, when I'm setting up a flow computer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to my Ethernet, and that's where I, my peer-to-peer -peer communication templates are. And I'm going to say, if I'm connecting to another module, another FlowX module that has the prover connected, I can say I want to connect to a remote prover I.O. server because I can share that prover with multiple modules from that other module. Or if I'm the module that is going to share the prover, and what I mean sharing is what it's doing is it's serving up the temperature, the pressure, the density off of the prover, and it's telling the prover to launch. The detector switches are still jumpered to each one of the modules that has a meter on it. But I can I can basically set up a remote uh, module and that module can have the prover connected. The launch command can be there and all these other remote ones when they want to prove they'll connect to the prover module and they'll tell it, hey, go ahead and launch the prover and give me temperature, pressure, and density, but I'm gonna do my own proving. And when I tell you, go ahead and launch again, but all the calculations get done on the meter that, on the module that actually has the physical meter on it. So depending on if I'm serving or if I'm acting as a server, I have to put the right communication template in there. And then I'll go ahead and I'll load the application into a flow computer. So, we load it into the flow computer, the flow computer starts back up, and we're able to go into the flow computer and start setting up our settings in it. And that's what we're gonna do. So I have a flow computer already attached, and I'll go ahead and uh, open up a web browser. If you haven't been to our home site, you can go to www.crt-services.com. And on that site, you'll find uh, support, and in that section for support, that'll give you the ability to uh, submit support tickets, look at the support videos we have, uh, do an RMA, and you'll also find uh, Flow Express software, manuals, job aid documentations, and a whole host of other things. So uh, please feel free to visit that and uh, get software, manuals, and also see all the uh, other uh, support links and so forth we have on there. But I'm going to connect into one of my flow computers that I have here at the uh, at the office and put in our secret uh, password, which in this case is just going to be letter A. And that'll log me into the flow computer. So in order to prove, one thing I do have to do is I have to make sure that I have physical pulses coming in. So with the FlowX, I'm able to simulate pulses by going into the maintenance mode and enabling pulse input, but I can't do that with um, with trying to prove because at the FPGA level, we actually need to see the physical pulses coming in to be able to start and stop counting. 
So we need to see both the physical pulses and I actually need to see a detector. I have to have a digital come in because I need to set the flags and see the flag set on the inputs. So the first thing I'm gonna do in setting up this flow computer is I have to tell it what kind of flow computer it is. And to do that, I've logged in and I'm gonna go to configuration. I'll go to overall setup and then I'll go to main settings. And the flow computer type, I'm gonna tell it that it's both a proving and a run flow computer. And I'll hit apply, my screen will blink real quick. And I don't have to worry about really the rest of the information that's on here uh, because I'm not gonna be due. I'm just gonna keep it as a single product. I'm not doing loading or, excuse me, any of the other functionality that's here. And I'll have two local meters. So I'm gonna come back up. Hey Brent. I'll look at, yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt, we have a question. No. Um, yeah. And he's asking about, he says, sorry for delaying the message, but as a topic of master meeting proving, does it work good on a line that runs multiple different products? On master meter proving, it, it absolutely does. The difficulty is you need to prove the master meter. So that master meter, as you're changing products, you're changing densities and, um, if that meter hasn't been proved at those flow rates or those densities of talking about your master meter, then the master meter has to be reproved and then the primary meter can be proved off of that. So we do need to be concerned about the different densities of the products that we're bringing in there and also the flow rate ranges that we're bringing in there because the flow rates will also dictate that I need to reprove that master meter and prove it again. Andy, does that uh, answer your question? Yep, perfectly. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So um, we'll get out of the main settings. Um, if we go into the calculation settings, we're just going to verify that our calculation settings are correct. Um, we're going to turn on API rounding and truncating, or we can leave it off. How many decimal places do we want to go to? Are we allowed to do extrapolation? This is all the normal setup that we're doing as part of the setup of the whole flow computer itself, which we've covered in some other classes. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into, I have to set up my meter runs real quick. Um, so I'm just going to set up these runs and I'm just going to force some of the values that are in there. So when I go into run setup, I'm going to keep it as a pulse meter. I'm going to say my observed density is always going to use the override. My standard density is going to be calculated from my observed. And I'll apply that. And then I'll come up one level and I'll go into my uh, temperature and I'll tell it to all oh, we'll use the temperature. I'll use a 60 degrees to start off with. I'll go to my pressure. I'll say always use and uh, let's give ourselves 150 pounds of pressure. We won't put that much on here. I'm going to say we're proving propane, it really doesn't make a difference, the fluid we're proving. Um, so for the density, I'll just put in there, I'll leave it as density and I'll put an override at point uh, 50, let's do 505. And we'll do that for our propane density. And that way I've got a density in there as well. The last thing I'll check when I look at the flow meters to make sure I've got my pulse input coming in and I'll look at my K factor, I'll leave it at a thousand right now because I can kind of prove with that. Um, I'll go to run number two and I'll do the same thing. I'll make sure that if I want to prove run two, but we're not going to prove run two, but I would go ahead and do the simulation on those and put those all in override. I'll come back up and I'll go into my products and we're just going to set up a simple product. As I said, we'll do propane. We'll select, uh, let's do table uh, 23, 24 E for NGL LPGs. I'm going to tell it the vapor pressure mode to use the standard. And that will set up my products. I don't care about the override or anything else. So. The next thing I'll go into is my IO. So I don't have any analogs coming in, but this is where I would assign my uh, my prover and inputs. If it's remote, which I'll show you when we determine whether the prover is remote or local, how do you set that up? So I'll go ahead and I'll say for digital number one, um, I have my pulse input coming in for my meter. 
So this will be my meter pulse. And then for digital input or digital two, I am going to use that as my detector switch input. So you'll see for detector switches, the Flowex has the ability to have two provers. So I can have a prover A and a prover B. They don't have to be the same type of provers. Each one can have its own settings. Um, it can be a piston prover and a ball prover. But each prover also has the ability to have four detector switches. So I can have a prover that has four volumes associated with it. And typically these detector switches run A, B, C, D, and I'll come up with volumes of a, a to C volume, an A to D volume, or a B to C volume, a B to D volume, or an A to B volume. So I can have a bunch of different volumes. If I only have one detector switch, which is probably 99% of the installations we do, um, then I'm just gonna select prover A, and I have a, both a common start stop. So this will assign digital two, as my detector switch coming in, and I'll just call it my detector switch. And then I wanna look at the, the input voltage threshold. Now, this is what we're gonna trigger at. So when I see that the voltage coming in on my input go above, I'm gonna determine that my uh, detector switch is made, but I just need to see it go low again. Um, so I'll set this to 12 volts because most of the switches are giving back voltage over 12 volts. Most times it's 24 volts, depending on uh, if it's coming off of a ball switch or whether it's coming out of the controller for the uh, piston provers. So we're gonna set this up. And then the last one I'm gonna do is I need an output, which is my launch command. So for my launch command, I'll set it up as a digital output. And then I'll come in and I'll say that this is my launch and it's normal. Now, if I needed that launch to be a high go low, I could say invert it, and that'll make it the signal normally high. And then when I launch it, it would go low. And then how long do I wanna hold this for? So I'll hold this for 500 milliseconds. So I'm gonna hold my output for 500 milliseconds to give it a launch. So now I've configured my IO, and now I just need to set up the prover. So in setting up the prover, we'll come back up, and we'll go into the prover and you can see as i said before i can have both a prover a and a prover b but you can also set up flow and pressure control on your provers and you can set up auto proving and we'll get into auto proving in a little bit but we'll, we'll right now we'll just stay with the basics on setting up the prover so we're going to set up the prover and this is where i tell it whether it's local or remote so it's a local prover and with the local prover i'm going to tell it is it a ball prover, unidirectional? Is it a Honeywell, NREF, Calibron, FMD, or um, the uh, uh, meter engineer's new prover? So we can, the magnet prove, but they're all considered piston provers. So this will be in the piston prover. The only one that's an anomaly is the Brooks compact prover, because that actually requires that you have a, a certain amount of pressure that's held on the poppet or the plenum. So, uh, it has some additional settings, but we're going to stay. We'll treat this as just a, a normal piston prover, and I'll hit OK. So now I get the option of setting up my prover. So I'll go into prover A, start my setup. Do I have an inlet temperature? Do I have an outlet temperature? So if I have an inlet temperature and an outlet temperature, what the flow computer does is it adds both temperatures together and then it divides by two and comes up with the average of the, the two temperatures that are coming in every calculation cycle. So if I tell it that it's not on the inlet, but it's on the outlet, will this make a difference in my calculation? No, it's again, it's just looking at what is the temperature of the prover. If you're using an inlet and an outlet, we'll average that. If you're just using one, then we're gonna just use that. So you can leave it right on here and it's it'll just leave it as it is. If you say none, it'll use the meter temperature, but we'll just say that we're gonna use, always use override. My rod temperature is, takes into consideration the thermal expansion of the rod. 
So as the rod gets uh, uh, expands or contracts because of temperature, we take into that in consideration and that can make a small adjustment to the volume. So if I have a transmitter on that, then I wanna make sure that I put that in as well, but I'll leave it on always override. Pressure is the same way. You have the ability for an inlet and outlet pressure. If you only have one, then you just use one. It doesn't make a difference whether you assign it to the inlet or outlet. So I'm gonna leave that and put it as always use override as well. And that way I can set those overrides. If I have a density, I can put my densitometer on. If I have four-way valve control, I can also do four-way valve control for it. With the prover density, um, if I don't select density, if I don't have a densitometer, then what I'm gonna do is just use the density of the meter and convert it for the density at the prover when I select none. So there's no setting I have to do here unless I have a densitometer. So those settings look good. We'll go ahead and go up one level and we'll get into the small volume prover. So this is where we start setting up the prover. Uh, there's no information on prover identification that affects the calculations. So we can put in pretty much anything we want. Uh, prover ID is shop. We'll put in the manufacturer as FMD. We'll put in the material as uh, stainless. And then we'll put in this real number is one, two, three, four, five. And we'll go ahead and apply those just so we have some information sitting there. So now we'll get off of our water draw certificate, the prover properties. So the internal diameter, the prover wall thickness, the prover square expansion coefficient, these will all be on your water draw certificates. And that's where that information should come from. The same way with the modulus of elasticity, the prover reference temperature and the reference pressure. So this will all come from those settings or those uh, that calibration certificate. In our detector configuration, we can set up where we have one common input. Well, we set up our digitals where we only had one detector, so we only have one common. But you can see if we had two detectors, I would have a start and a stop, or three detectors, four detectors, and so on. But as I said, most commonly, we're just using one. Single detector delay, this is that debounce. This is when the, the ball hits the piston or the ball hits the plunger for the detector switch and will ignore for two tenths of a second that that slap that comes in when we're using a uh, a piston prover we're going to set this to zero though and this way we don't have any delay when i hit the first detector then i'll arm the second detector or i'll look at arming myself again to see this second detector which means that basically i'm looking at the same digital input i arm a flag internally in the fpga and when i see the first detector I, that signal goes high, and then when it makes the second detector, it sends the signal high again. So when I'm proving, I see the same signal go high twice. I assume, since I only have one input, I assume the first time I see it, it is the launch or it is the start proving. And then the second time I see it, it's the end proving. Now we can get out of sync with the prover especially if we miss a detector switch. And again, we're just sitting here waiting. We don't know because we only see one switch come in, truly which switch we got. The same way with a ball prover. I don't know if I'm hitting the first switch or second to sw switch when they're ganged together. I'm just going by my sequence. And if I see after a launch, the detector go uh, signal come in, then I'm gonna assume it's the first one and I'll start proving. When I see a voltage spike again, I'll assume it's the second detector and I'll stop proving. But like I said, you can get out of sync. And there's some things that uh, that happen when, you know, because we, maybe we missed the switch because we had a high single detector delay. So we need to make some adjustments on that. Prover volume, again, this comes off the water draw certificate. I'm gonna put my prover volume at 1.0056. We'll see if that gets us close to a one meter factor on what I'm doing. And we'll start um, we'll start looking at these detector sweat settings right here. So as we're proving, what's happening with proving is we are doing a stabilization 
and then we're going to issue a launch. So that launch is going to send a digital output. Well, depending on, excuse me, the manufacturer of the prover, at times when we issue a launch, we could see a voltage drop. And when we see a voltage drop, we would see that also on the detector switch. And the detector then, seeing a voltage drop or a voltage spike, thought that it saw the first detector switch and it would start proving. But the piston's still be moving, being drawn back. So it starts proving, the piston's still being drawn back, it releases the piston, now the piston hits the first switch, but we think it's the second switch, and then we hit end proving, and the piston comes back, starts coming back down. But we've already, we already think that we've completed that run, and we issue a launch again. Well, the piston's only three quarters of the way down, and all of a sudden we send the chain or the the shuttle back up, catch that piston as it's coming, and kind of do a slam and drag it back again, and start again. So what we've added is this pre-travel delay time, and there's a little help right here that says after the launch command, the sequent wait, waits this much time before looking for the first detector. So if I think that I may have a voltage drop or a voltage spike when I issue a launch, then what I can do in here is just put a second or a tenth of a second. And what will happen is I'll issue the launch and then I'll wait a second and then I'll arm the FPGA detector input to look for that, that voltage spike or drop. So um, you can add in as many seconds as you think you need to add in there, but typically with a piston prover or a ball, the launch command's only lasting 500 milliseconds. So a second should alleviate any, any voltage drop or spike. Well, now I issued the launch, I waited my second. Now I go and I look at my next settings. So I'm gonna leave these right now in travel timeout mode. So with travel timeout mode, what I'm going to look at then is what is my maximum pre-travel time? So the pre-travel time is I issued a launch. I waited my one second. Now I have this many seconds to see that first detector switch. If I don't see it within eight seconds, then I will issue a abort prover inactivity. So it's just a timer. Again, if I don't see the switch, abort inactivity. If I do see it, then that timer stops and I look at my next timer. And what I'll see is I'll see the status of the prover will go from launch and then it hits the first switch and it goes to proving. And then I start the timer for the maximum proof time. So this is the maximum amount of time I'll wait from first detector to timeout to hit second detector. So if I don't see that second detector within 60 seconds, what happens? I abort prover inactivity. If I do see the second detector switch, then what will happen is the prover or the status for the prover will go from proving to over travel. And now it's going to look at my over travel setting. So I'll put my over travel time here at five seconds and it's going to wait five seconds before it issues a launch again. So if it's on a ball prover, that's the amount of time that I'm going to wait and allow that ball to travel to get back in the launch chamber. On a piston prover, it's the amount of time that I'm waiting and that piston is going to go back to the home position and just sit there waiting. And then I'm going to launch it back again after five seconds. This is really important if you're doing it by time when you look at the flow rates you have. Because if I have a ball that, and I'm dealing with a small meter, and it takes that ball 20 seconds to travel all the way back to the launch chamber because I'm in a, in a, 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 a lower flow rate, then this setting may have to be higher. If I'm doing a really fast rate, that ball may get there in a couple seconds, and then I'm just sitting there waiting for extra seconds. So we really need to look at these timing settings. Now, do any of these timing settings affect your meter factor? By and large, no. So if you are timing out and getting a prover and activity before I see the first detector switch, then I just need to increase this time because it's obviously taking me longer to see the first detector switch. But the difference of this timeout 
being 60 seconds versus 10 seconds has no impact on meter factor. It's, it's just how long do we wait before we time out on an activity. The same way if I don't see the first detector switch, this is the timer that's going to time me out, but it doesn't affect the meter factor at all. What can affect the meter factor is your over travel time. Are you allowing conditions to settle or you're keeping things turbulent? And uh, in, in, you know, where we're the pistons constantly drawing back and then releasing and that's changing the velocity of the flow just a little bit because it's got to it's got to uh, move that piston down and then I'm immediately launching again. So depending on the proof, the uh, meter manufacturer that you talk to, they may have uh, different settings that they want you to try. I've seen where some customers have set their, their over travel up to 30 seconds to allow the whole system to calm down before they issue a launch again. And I've seen others where this is a tenth of a second, that as soon as it hits the, tech, the second detector switch, it waits a tenth of a second and starts that piston back again and starts proving. So I'm always moving constantly. So this depends on the, the meter type that you have and uh, kind of what your philosophy is behind it. Um, as to how you set this, but these prover time and settings, again, there's nothing in that prover time and setting that's going to affect your um, the meter factor calculation. So in changing these, you're not going to implement the meet, you're not going to modify the meter factor. You're just going to change when you're timing out and aborting. Meter factor calculation, you have two different methods that you can utilize. The average data method where we look at the pulse counts between each run and that's how we determine the repeatability is by pulse counts or you can do it by meter factor each run we derive a meter factor and we look at the repeatability or the uncertainty between those meter factors i'm going to keep it on average data method right now and then my prove start command we said that we put that at digital three so we'll put that at digital three and then I know that that's set up right because over on the right, when I had called it the launch, it's telling me that I, I signed that to digital three and digital three was labeled as launch. So I've got my prover set up. I've got a few more settings I wanna look at. So I'll come up and I'll look at my operation. The operation is what are the maximum number of runs that I allow this prover to run to try to get my proving criteria, my repeatability, or my uncertainty. In this case, we said 10. The FlowX can do up to 30 runs, but we'll just keep it at 10 for simplicity. How many passes? So how many times does the piston need to go from upstream to downstream? One time, and that will equal one pass equals run one run, but I could say that it has to do that five times, and that equals one run. So you can change that setting as well. What are the required successful number of runs? Well, I need to see five. I could change that to three and go from there, but we'll just keep it at five again uh, for simplicity. Am I using double chronometry? Well, this uh, I need to on this one because I won't generate 10,000 pulses in the volume of my prover. So I'm gonna go ahead and enable that. Your run repeatability test method, right now it's based upon pulse counts. That was our setting here this meter factor calculation method. You can see if I change that to meter factor. Now, when I come back up and back into operational, you'll see that it says meter factor, but I'll go ahead and change it to back to pulse counts. So I've got pulse counts. How are we doing our we're in repeatability mode. Are we doing it by repeatability? Meaning I'm gonna look at that 0.05% or do I wanna do it by progressive uncertainty? Where with progressive uncertainty, I want the 0.027%. So you can do it by either. It's the same number, but again, the progressive uncertainty would allow me to say, you know what? I want a maximum of 20 runs now and I'll let the thing run. And if it gets it at 18, and it comes in with an uncertainty of 0.027%, that's perfect. But we'll leave it traditionally at 10, and we'll go back to fixed repeatability limit. Do I want to auto implement the meter factor if it meets certain criteria? Yes or no. If I do, 
then I say yes. And if it meets the criteria that you set in under uh, under your other settings under here and the prover for your stability and your meter factor tests, then it will automatically implement it. If not, it's going to have a meter factor manual acceptance timeout because with the proving on the proving report, I want to put whether you implemented that meter factor or did not implement that meter factor. So I'm going to give you 180 seconds to manually accept it. If you don't accept it within that time, I'll reject it based upon timeout that it wasn't approved within the within your considered amount of time. Hey, Brent, so again, if I yes, uh, Alonzo's got a question. Hang on, Alonzo, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Alonzo. Uh, just real quick, uh, I, I raised it as you uh, were going over the uncertainty. Uh, yes. portion of the run repeat run repeat repeatability mode. How often do you uh -huh. see that setting being utilized compared to the fixed? Um, uh, actually, fixed? I'm I'm seeing it used uh, more frequently, and more companies are going using that as their standard. API really wants us to go to uncertainty proving instead of using the fixed method. Really? So, uh, yes, and I, we've got some some of our larger customers are switching over and, and using uncertainty now. OK. And okay. globally, it's 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 it, there's you're going to see another setting in here that you actually can do it not by meter factor, by but by meter percent error. And okay. you can generate a percentage error correction instead of a meter factor, which is something they're starting to do in Europe um, and some other countries. But yeah, we're seeing more and specifically we're seeing more customers starting to use the progressive uncertainty because it allows them to push more volume through piston provers when they're proving um, meters that manufacture a pulse, Coriolis meters, ultrasonic meters, where you're not getting a lot of volume through. This allows gotcha. you to do more provings, but it allows you to get some of those um, flyers where you maybe, you know, the first three runs look good. The fourth run was just slightly out. But it, it, by repeatability, you would have to start a new five consecutive um, runs in order to to get your your uh, your repeatability. Well, the uncertainty factors that in as well and allows you to keep going using that that. And and part of it is that that flyer that a lot of us say, hey, we we, we got this. Um, you know, the third run was kind of out there. This allows us uh, to actually use the third run because that actually happened. That count that you have there was a count during that run. And, you know, with repeatability method, you can't just throw that out. Um, I know that there's software out there that allows you to pick out bad runs and delete them. Yeah. That's not real. That's not a good method. That's what happened on your proving. Prove it again. If it happens again, you've got a problem. But it may not be a big problem. The uncertainty method will allow you to see that problem and but still say, you know what? This is good over time. And I okay. still have that same uncertainty. So, yeah, it is something that we're seeing a lot more customers starting to use. Excellent. Thanks, Brent. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Any other questions? OK. You can have custom permissives, so I may have something coming from a PLC that won't allow me to approve um, unless I get a uh, Signal saying my valves are lined up or whatever. I can turn that on and assign a digital or write a word status to it. Prove integrity. If I'm using a four way valve, this allows me to, if I select, excuse me, yes, then I can determine um, what type of prover integrity I'm going to use on the four way valve. But I'm going to say nope because I don't have that. And the last question is do I have a preliminary proof report? So I said before, we want you to implement the factor, right? Because I want to put that on the proven report, the official proven report. I want to I want to print out. Did you put it on? Did you implement it or did you not implement it? But we have customers that said, I actually want to see the whole proving before I implement it to know that it's good. And I want to see a paper ticket of it. Well, you can have a preliminary proof report come out and that will basically generate a proof report. Um, you can look it over and then determine whether you want to implement the factor or not implement the factor. Once you implement it, we'll then give you another proof report with that meter factor implemented or not implemented. Okay, so that's operational. 
stability. I'm going to turn on both of the stabilization checks, but stability, what we're looking at is um, we want to make sure that the process is stable before we start proving. And we also want to make sure the process is stable while we're proving. So we do two things. When you initially uh, issue a launch command or a prove command, if you have the initial stabilization check turned on, so if it's if it's enabled here, then what we're what we say is, I'm going to look for 30 seconds, the maximum amount of time I will look. During that 30 seconds, I need to see five consecutive seconds where the temperature doesn't change by three degrees, where the pressure change doesn't change by more than 50 PSI, and where the flow rate doesn't change by more than 5%. These are really exaggerated numbers. I'm hoping that you're more like, I don't see the temperature change by more than five tenths and maybe 10 pounds but your process conditions will dictate that. The same way with the flow rate change. These are all criteria that you can set. So this is just, if I don't get this, then I'm gonna get uh, unstable flow, uh, pe uh, temperature and pressure out of limits and so forth. Once this is good, then I actually issue the launch. So I'll see in my status, I'll hit prove and I'll see stabilization stabilizing. Once it's good, you'll see me go to launch. Once I hit the first detector, I will look at the sequence stabilization and I'll still look at the initial stabilization in here. I'm not concerned about my time anymore. What I'm looking at is I don't want my temperature to change, my pressure to change, my flow rate to change, and I also want to make sure that the deviation between my prover and meter for temperature and pressure are within tolerance and my tolerance again may be one degree or whatever that is as soon as i hit the second detector i ignore these so that way as the piston is being drawn back again as the ball is changing direction i don't care about the flow rate i don't care about if i see a deviation but when i hit that first detector i'm going to look at these again immediately so as soon as i hit the detector if I'm more than one tenth of a degree out, or if I'm more than one degree out, then I am going to uh, abort that on temperature and pressure deviations. Again, if I don't want to do that, if I don't want to do any of the checks, I'm just going to go ahead and disable that. And if I'm initially commissioning this system and starting it up, what I may do is come in and disable these altogether, so I'm not doing any stabilization. And I'll just disable these so I don't have to worry about being kicked out because of deviations and temperature and pressure and everything while I'm trying to troubleshoot some other issues. So we've completed our proving. And then we have our tests that we can look at for automatic meter factor implementation. And you can enable any combination or disable any combinations of these. So the first meter factor test that we would do is we would say we have a limit test. I won't allow a meter factor to be greater than 0.1.01 or less than 0.99. So you can really, if let's say that I have a BLM limit and the BLM, uh, the Bureau of Land Management says, you know what, you can't have a meter factor that's greater than, um, uh, Let's say let's uh, get one one point zero zero two five and no lower than point nine nine seven five. So if I put these two conditions in, I know that no matter what meter factor I derive, if it's not in this range, it's not going to automatically be implemented. I can also look at my previous meter factor. Now there's a caveat to looking at the previous meter factor and uh, most flow computers are this way as well. The previous meter factor looks at the previous automatically implemented meter factor, meaning that if you manually type in a meter factor, it doesn't look at the manually implemented meter factor. It looks at only an accepted meter factor that was automatically implemented. So that test will only look at that. So if your last meter factor that was automatically implemented was something different than what you have here, 
then you're not going to want to turn this on until you automatically implement a meter factor and then you'll turn this back on so it can look at the deviation between your last automatically implemented meter factor that's the same that's true for the historical meter factors and if you think about um i've had people ask me why why does it look at that that way if you look at your audit trail and if you look at the proven reports that you have, I said, we need to put on that proven report whether that meter factor was implemented. So I could look back through the audit trail and, and maybe see that you manually type that meter factor in, but it's uh, the logic in the flow computer always wants it to be automatically implemented before it does that comparison. And again, the same way with the historic. I don't have to turn these on, but this will take a look at that meter factor uh, deviation. And as long as it's uh, within the last 10 average meter factors within 0.25%, you're good. And what this helps is if you don't have a limit, a high limit like this or a low limit that's going to keep you in check, then what can happen is if you just look at the previous meter factor test, if your criteria is that my previous meter factor has to be within 0.25%, if that meter factor comes in at a one, and well, let me change that. If that meter factor comes in at a 1.0020, well, that's within 0.25% of the previous factor. So I'll implement a new factor of 1.0020. And then I prove again, and I'm 0.0019 out. Well, now that new meter factor can be a 1.0039. Well, now I'm getting way off from where my first meter factor was, and we start getting this drift where we get higher, higher, lower, lower, and I'm getting away from my historical meter factors, meaning mm -hmm. that I'm starting to see creep on that meter, meaning I maybe have something wearing now. So this allows us to look at the last 10 historical ones. If you're using uh, a meter factor curve, you can enable the base curve testing, where when you initially set up and created the base curve for your meter, you can compare the new meter factors that you're getting, and they have to be within uh, X percent to the curve you've derived. And then if you use a meter factor control chart, internally, we'll look at the previous meter factors and we'll check against them, and they have to be within um, a certain percentage as, as per API 13.2 on the way you do a control chart. So we'll compare it against. Now we're not going to present you with a control chart, but we're going to do the requirements are going to be within the tolerances of the control chart. So that's what that means by turning that on. I come back up and this is where we can set up our temperature and pressure. And we said that we're always going to use the override on these. So we'll keep the temperature at 60, the rod temperature at 60, and then I'll put the pressure at uh, yeah, we'll put that at 120 pounds again. All right, so we've done our configuration. I'm going to go back up real quick and click on the proof report. And on the proof report, I can say whether I want it can be in compliance with API 12.2, whether I want to print just accepted runs, because the templates are only set up for 10 runs, and then it's going to tell you the report quantity type. Is it a meter quantity or is it a volume based or is it a mass based? So what it'll do is you you can prove the flow computer as a let's say that you have a mass meter. Well, when you prove a meter that's uh, pulse output is in mass, then we have to convert the prover into a mass instead of instead of a volume. So we're going to convert the prover into mass that volume into a mass and then we're going to compare mass to mass if it's a volume pulse coming in then we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at the volume and we'll compare the volume of the prover against the volume of the uh, meter by looking at the pulses and the water draw but i can do alternates on this so if i have a mass pulse coming in i can say that i don't want to look at the meter quantity i want it based on volume and what will happen is instead of me converting the prover into a mass, I'm going to leave the prover as a volume and I'm going to convert the meter from mass to volume and I'll do a volume to volume comparison. The reverse is true is I can take a volume coming in and say I want to prove based upon mass. 
and I'll convert the prover from a volume to mass, and I'll convert the meter from a volume to mass, even though my pulse input. Or if I leave it as the meter quantity type, then it's just going to select whatever quantity I selected for the meter, which right now is in volume, and it's going to prove by volume. So, and once we're all set, the first thing I'm going to check before I issue a launch is I've set up my prover. I want to make sure that my detector switch is in the low position. So I want to make sure that when I detect a detector switch, my input status goes from a zero to one. So I'm looking at the, the leading edge, not the trailing edge of whatever the signal is. If we look at a, how a signal comes in, let's say a pulse signal coming in, in, then that signal can that uh, signal coming in has a leading edge where it's going above the voltage, and it has a trailing when it drops below. How long it's being held for is up to either the uh, the mechanical switch that's there, or the controller, the PIM module, the 401D, whatever the control board is inside. How long that's going to hold that detector for? Well, that time can vary. So if I'm looking at the trailing edge of a switch, I very well could have varying times which would affect my meter factor because I say one time it was 100 milliseconds, the next time it's 150 milliseconds, and that, that difference is some volume or some mass that goes through there. So I always want to make sure when I'm looking at the um, setup of the flow computer that once I'm ready to start proving, and I know I've got power to my detector switches, if I go into maintenance, and then I look at IO diagnostics. When I come down in, I'm going to look at the state of my detector switch, and I can see that it's a zero, which is good. Now, what if it wasn't a zero? What if I had voltage on that? Do I need to go rewire? No. Just go back into your IO. And if that switch was showing a one right now, I would just come into the detector switch and I would invert it, and I would say it's a zero. That's it. So pretty simple, but this is uh, this is um, an issue that I see some customers can have that when they look at that diagnostics, that their switch is a one, which means that when it drops, we're not going to start counting yet until it goes high again. So we're going to we're going to have a delay in that, and we don't want to see that. We need to we need to see it on the rising edge. So that's good. Now I can go back to my home screen. And I can actually prove this. So on the operation screen, I'll go into proving. And you can see that I can see my prove run results. I can also see each run, the time between detectors, the pulse count, and the meter factor. My meter factor tests, whether they passed or not passed. Even if you disable these, it's still going to show you if they passed or failed the tests. And then I can actually look at my settings and enable and disable some of those tests. So this is all at the operator's level. These are the same tags, data points that are down in configuration and proving. So as an example, if I say previous meter factor tests, I'll come down into previous meter factor tests when I set up the prover. So we'll come into prover, meter factor tests, previous meter factor tests, disable. So if I disable it here, it's the it's the same tag when I go up into proving meter factor tests that would be oops that would be here. So you're disabling or enabling it. Basically, it's just shown two different spots. But I'm going to turn that back on. You'll see the screen flash because it wants to update and put in a percentage deviation. And now I'll go back home. I'll issue my proving. So I'm going to go ahead. It says I'm idle, ready to start. I do have to have flow. My flow is in the forward direction. And I've got my volume sitting here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit start proving. And it's going to issue the launch. Now, it's issuing the launch, which means it's drawing back. And I just hit first detector switch. When I see it go from launch to proving, I know that I've hit the first detector switch. 
when I see it go from proving to over travel, I know I hit the second detector switch. And our first meter factor, so my first run's meter factor average so far is a 0.9967. It goes through its over travel of five seconds, reissues the launch. After it does the over travel and issues the launch, it updates its meter factor, but right now I'm doing pretty well. And you look down here, I'm on my current run is three. My current pass is one. I only have one pass. I've done three runs. I've done three successful runs, which means that my prover criteria was 0.005%. They have to be within. I'm 0.05%. I'm, I'm at 0.007%. So I'm basically, if I average that, I'm at 0.01%, which is fine. And you see my prover uncertainty, I went 0.027 and I'm at 0.0055%. So if as long as we this next run goes good, it'll go proving over travel. And now the meter factor test limit failed. So it's not going to implement it. So what failed on it? Well, it was a 0.996. And again, when I look at those meter factor tests, the 0.996, um, it failed the limit test, but it passed the other's test. So it looked at the previous meter factor and it's too far off because the previous meter factor was a run, a one. So now I'll go into my settings and I'll tell it, eh, you know what, let's do this. Let's go ahead and uh, I'll disable the uh, previous meter factor test so I can get a good factor and then I can imp have it implement that factor um, automatically. So I'll do another proving. Now we had some customers that while this is proving, they actually went and um, disabled the uh, low and high limits. And unfortunately they had somebody come in and do a proving and they left it in auto. Uh, they had disabled all of the meter factor tests. So it generated a meter factor of like 0.1. And then they walked away. Well, it implemented that factor because it wasn't doing any testing to not implement the factor. So everything looked good on it. And uh, yeah, that was kind of a problem. So if you put in a criteria like this, you know, at least I'm not going to put in a totally junky meter factor if it's automatically implemented. And we'll just let this, it's on the fourth run. You can see I'm pretty consistent in my factor. And not bad repeatability for a junky uh, relay. Ooh, we had a bad count there. I got a point oh two eight six. So that meter factor came in kind of something happened on it. Somebody might have hit something on it. So um, the other thing we'll do is when we're done with the meter factor, we can go in and we can pull up our proving. So I have two proven reports. I'm going to bring up Flow Express real quick. In the FlowX, these are the standard reports that you have. By default, I have enabled all of them. So when you start using the new Liquids application, it doesn't matter whether you select a pipe prover, um, but each one has a separate template. You can modify these templates and add information in, take information off, but you must keep the template name the same. So if I wanted to, let's say, uh, uh, modify the uh, compact proven report, what I would do typically is I'm going to go ahead and copy that and paste it right back in. And I'll take the original compact proven report and I'll label it as old. So now that's modified the name, so it's a, it's not going to use that report. And I'll keep mine now as the compact prover. So I always have the original template, but now I can go in and modify the template myself. 
and I can change in the properties the number of files. So right now it's going to keep the last hundred provings. I can modify that and say I want the last thousand provings or whatever you want. But this report is only for a compact prover and it's using the data method. If I want to use the one for the meter factor method, then I have to select the meter factor method template. Or if I'm using mass, mass, mass meter factor, and you can see we have them for master meter and also the pipe provers. So once we go back in, I can pull that report up. I can save it. And it's going to download it. I'll open it as a text file. And then I get my proven right. report. And I can take a look at the data. One thing I always tell customers too is when you're having problems getting good meter factors, take out this information. We give you the math here on what you're supposed to do, but if I take out the corrections for steel and the effects on the prover, and if I go to the meter and take out the corrections for liquids, I can basically just go total pulses and go and look at my total pulses and K factor to give me my metered volume without all the corrections, and then look at my base prover volume, and then I'll just divide line my base prover volume by my pulses metered volume, and that will give me my meter factor, and it takes out any of the corrections, and that at least tells me are my pulses the problem, or is it something in my temperature and pressure or density that's affecting the corrections here? Hey, Brent. Yes, sir. Um, Alonzo's got a question. Is that where you adjust yeah. the report to show the passing runs, i.e. the report uh, prints 1 through 10, but passing runs were 7 through 16? Right. So automatically what will happen is when we selected in the uh, – when we were setting up the prover and we said print accepted runs only, then what it's doing is if I had rejected runs in here, they wouldn't be in here. So even though physically I may be on my eighth run, and let's say that my eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth are the one that come in, I'll list them on this report because I said only accepted runs as one, two, three, four, five. So these are the accepted runs. Now they physically they may be, like I said, runs 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 that took place um, during the proving, but on the proving report, they'll come in and it's one through five. If I uncheck and say all runs, then all I would see on here were the first seven bad runs, the good 8th, ninth, and 10th, but the 11th and 12th runs won't be on this report. You would have to add rows to, the, to add in, let's say you were going to allow it to go to 20 runs. But if I wanted to show all the runs, and I was only allowing to do a maximum of 10 runs, then I would also say eh, show all runs because I'm only letting it go to 10 anyhow. But yeah, if I just want the accepted runs going on here that are part of my proving, then when I go into my prover setup in configuration and for my prover A, you should have a setting here that says, give me a second to find it, that I will show I just had it. Actual stabilization check, your factor test. I'm going to have to find the setting again because there is a setting in here that it says only show only. Um, successful runs. We're going to take a break here for a couple minutes. Um, we're going to start back up at uh, 20, uh, let's do 25 after. We'll take a short nine minute break. When we come back, I'll show you where the setting is. Um, and then we're going to go over auto proving and a couple other things. I apologize, I'm running late on proving and uh, I don't feel like we can give sampling all of the attention that we need. So what we'll do is we'll do sampling as our next event and uh, we'll throw another uh, subject, a smaller subject in behind them. But I really want to uh, make sure that I'm not shortchanging what's going on with proving, especially the new auto proving functionality. So um, let's take a, a, a short break for um, about 
let's say 10 minutes, so till 27, and then that'll take us, um, the rest of the time will take us right up to 11 o'clock. So uh, I'll see you back in a minute. We are back. Let me share my screen again. Ken, can you give me a thumbs up or a yell that uh, you can hear me and see the screen? Yeah, we're good to go, man. All right, good deal. So uh, before we took break, I said I was going to tell you where that setting was, um, and I am. So this is the setting for printing accepted runs. So I'm going to go back into configuration. I'll go to proving. I'll go to proving report and print accepted runs only. So if I disable that, I'll print all the runs. If I leave this enabled by default, then I'll print just the accepted runs. And are there any questions on anything here? All right. So what I'm going to do now is in the prover setup, I'm going to uh, go into the small volume prover. We said that uh, some of the settings we have in here, um, we can modify these to uh, to change the way that we're doing, uh, let's say the average data method, or again, the meter factor method. We do have a lot of customers that are starting to use the meter factor method. Um, which one should you use? I uh, can't answer that. Uh, every company that I've I've seen is a, is a little bit different in uh, who's using what method. So, I'm going to go ahead and discard those uh, changes in our operation. We're able to, again, set up our preliminary proof reports. We can go through, we can uh, set auto implement new meter factor. I'm going to go ahead and, and turn that on. And we'll leave out the run repeatability mode. And then I'm going to go back into stability checks. Just make sure everything is still set up in here. I'm not going to do the initial stabilization. I'm not going to do uh, some of the other checks. I'm going to go ahead and disable most of the checks in here. So that way we're not running into any problems off the base curve. And again, my temperature and pressure. So what happens if I have a prover that's remote? So this is not the primary prover, but um, I'm connecting to a uh, module that has the prover connected to it. Well, I don't need to worry about configuring a launch command because that module is going to take care of the launch command. I do need to make sure I set up my detector switch input, that I have my detector switch coming back in, and of course my meter pulses. But now when I set up this, this prover, um, going into prover A, <clears throat> I'm going to say that it's remote. Now, when I tell it it's remote, it's asking me what device is remote. So I set up those communication templates in ports and devices, and it's looking for the name of that template. So when I loaded it, I kept the default names here, but I could also change the names and put in the flow computer number and so forth. But you can see here, I want to connect to a remote IO prover server. So I connect there, I hit connect, and boom, the magic happens, except it doesn't really. We still have to go in and set something else up. What we're going to set up is we have to set up on our communication, we have to set the IP address and the Modbus ID of the remote the flow computer we're connecting to. So when I go home, you'll see we have a communication um, icon. Now, anything that we use a template for for communication, it will create a icon and web interface for that connection. So if I'm acting as a remote prover IO server, I don't get much. It just asks me, since I'm serving up the information, what is the ID that I'm at? So this was if I had the prover, this was the remote prover module. I'm the remote prover module. If you want to connect to me, hit my IP address and come to Modbus ID 1. But we're doing the opposite. I actually want to connect to a remote prover IO server. So to connect to a remote prover IO server, I simply hit this. I put in the IP address. So I'll put in a 10.1.10. Uh, let's put in 200. We'll connect to something. 
I don't know what it is at 200. And that will get us our connection to the remote device. So now I have a remote prover server. You can see that it failed because yes. I really don't have a connection to anything. Yes. But when I go in and start setting up the prover now, and we said it was remote, then what's going to happen is it knows to get its information from that remote device. So there's really not that many settings that we have to do inside here. We're just basically going to go in and, and do our proving and do our control over it. And uh, that will get us set up in, in, in our proving. So we've got our remote prover. And if we want to do, I don't know, if we want to do auto proving, then we can set up auto proving in this. Um, and I'll turn on auto proving. And I'm going to bring our prover back as a uh, let me go back into the prover setting because I want to bring the prover back as a local prover. And we'll put it back as a Honeywell NRAF. So when we enable auto proving, we'll come in and in auto proving, you can select which prover. Each prover can have its uh, own auto proof settings. The maximum number of aborts. The maximum number of rejects. So um, the number of consecutive meter factors that will be rejected. Uh, prover permissive timeout and a valve lineup request. So that's some of the initial settings. But then when you go into, I'll go back up. When I go into the runs and go to flow meter. Uh, it's not there. Where did they put the auto proof? It should be there. That should be auto proof A, number of runs, proof of permissive timeout. Valve lineup request doesn't need to be enabled. And then on the small volume prover, but it should. Let me go back over to my control signals. It should bring up in the run setup my auto proof functionality. And I apologize because normally the auto proof was right in here. But I think we've got a configuration issue um, in this application. And I just get pulled this application down from one I was doing some testing on for a customer. So I think I may have messed up the displays on this one, unfortunately, um, because our auto proof settings would be right inside here. And this is where we would go in and set our our time between uh, the number of the, the volume that has to be done for auto proving um, and some of the other functionality of how frequently we need to auto prove. Um, there's more settings in here than just a uh, simple valve lineup and, and so forth in there. So I apologize that uh, that's not really a good example, but when I edit the video, I will hey, add Brent. this last, yeah. Sorry, uh, Paul asked a question. There is a lot of value uh, watching you troubleshoot things like this. So, thanks, Paul. That's not actually oh, a question, it's a comment. Oh, oh, you wanna see why it's not in there? So yeah, that's pretty good. So let's. I have no idea why it's not in here. It should be in here. So where am I going to look to see where it's at? Well, I'm going to go back to Flow Express because obviously I've got something either in a display or a configuration on a display that wasn't um, wasn't created properly uh, in what I was doing. So what I'm going to do is go back and I'm going to look at my displays. So Paul, I turn the your mic on. So in the displays, everything, all the menu structures and everything that I'm going through are all here as well. This is how we create the menus. This is how we create the uh, drill downs. This is how we uh, show and hide things. So I know that if I go into configuration, it's gonna be under proving. And then under the proving setup, when I look at my auto prove, you can see that we've got some conditions over on the right-hand side that will select whether um, auto prove is, uh, I'm going to show or hide certain tags within that and also whether that auto proof screen up top here even shows because it says 
Well, I've got to have a level that's greater than or equal to a display level and auto proof has to be enabled. But then when I look at the individual runs where I believe the auto proof functioning actually needs to be, it should be under the flow meter. This is where they told me that they were actually going to put it in here, that each flow meter was going to have its own auto proof functionality. So that's where I expected it to be, but I don't see it in there. So I'm wondering when they made the update, if uh, if it was actually left out of here or it wasn't part of this release and it's part of a different release that I didn't add in here. And that that may be the case because auto proof, this is application 5.1 auto proof was added in, but I don't believe the full auto proof was added in um, to all the displays um, on this application. I've got to check with the factory to find out why it's not in there. The other place I'll typically look is I'll come back into the definition of the flow computer. And in the background, I have access to be able to come in and start looking at some of these settings that are inside here and how the logic's done. And that proof required as part of the auto proof. So they do it by flow rate, standard density, temperature, pressure, viscosity, and so forth. But I believe all of these settings, which are so supposed to be on the display while the functionality is in there, the display wasn't set up for it. So if for some reason something like that happens, I'll come back in and create the display for it. But I believe that, again, coming from the factory, they did it right. Um, it's me changing some of the displays for a customer. And this is uh, an example that I had set up for them that I believe I deleted out the displays for this, but I'll add those back in. And then um, in the video, I'll actually make sure that everything shows up correctly in there for the auto proof functionality because again it should just be underneath each one of the runs um not underneath any of the meter factors for auto proof like i said it should be just right underneath the flow meter here and this does not have auto proof in it so the functionality is in the logic it's just not written in the configuration for it so um I will go find out why. Are there any questions I can answer from what we've gone over? Let me bring the screen back up. And specifically on proving or uh, <laughs> since we're open, um, are there any other things, any other questions that somebody might have? Paul said, gotcha. That was worth the price of admission. I didn't yeah. know about yeah. the logic of, for displays. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Yeah, we have a whole uh, we have a whole class on uh, just displays and how to create your own displays. Because again, the FlowX is meant to be uh, it comes with a standard, but that standard then is something that uh, you can modify, change to meet your needs. So we'll create or we'll have customers create their own screens and. Uh, They'll put an operator screened in there. They'll put a proving operator um, with the displays. These displays are nothing more than folders that hold tag groupings. And they have conditions of when they're going to hide or show, but they can copy from I can copy this this display. From one application and paste it into another application. I can copy um, if there's something in configuration that I wanted to bring up, um, I don't know, for run three, I wanted to see this information. You can copy that and either create your own display and paste that information in there and put your own tags, your own icons and so forth, and then write that down. But all of the displays, as you're testing them, you can go into a preview user interface and what that will do is it'll do a short little compile and then the new displays that you're adding, you can then go in, you can see we called that tag display and that tag display shows up here. Now, if I change anything here, it doesn't change anything really in the flow computer and it doesn't change anything in the parameters because I'm on a display and this is just simulating display, but in the configuration. And again, if I change the name of that, from tag display to Brent display, then 
when I preview that, <clears throat> it, instead of it saying tag display, it'll come up and say rent display. So that's why it does that. Are there any other questions? All right, uh, cool. If it did any time you do have questions, obviously um, give us a shout here at the office. We are asking customers um, since our support staff is growing that if you could call our main office number for support, um, that would be uh, great because that will get you to uh, one of the support people that we have. Or if uh, for some reason everybody's busy, please leave us a voicemail and uh, we'll get right back to you. Um, if you want to just submit an email, uh, if you submit it to support or service at crt.services, so yeah, I can do support at crt.services or service at crt.services. If you send that email, that will create a uh, ticket in our work order system for us, and uh, we get notified right away when new emails come into that. Plus, it's a way that we can track what questions or issues that customers have, and you can always come back in and look at previous issues. Uh, there's a whole tracking system in this work order system. Um, let me bring this up real quick. That basically when I go into, uh, let's say the uh, CRT support homepage, it brings you to our little Zoho desk. And if you sign in, you can uh, create a ticket, you can search through our help center, but any tickets uh, that have been submitted for your company that you work for, you'll also have access to those to be able to see what the resolutions were um, and so forth. The same way if you need Flow Express licenses, if you send them to service or support at CRT.services, then anybody can generate them and we'll give those licenses right out to you. If you send them to an individual email address here, uh, just like I've been gone for the past uh, couple days, I don't necessarily uh, get the chance always to get into my email, depending on where I'm at. And it could be a day or so before you get a license, as opposed to if you just send it to the Zoho desk, typically you get a response um, uh, within 30 minutes to an hour, hour and a half. So um, please uh, utilize that and uh, our main support number. But at any time, if you have questions, give us a shout. And if you've got uh, ideas for other topics, um, also let us know. Well, I hope everybody has a good rest of the week and uh, we will get this posted up uh, after we process the video. So we should have this up by the end of the week. Um, thank you and uh, have a good day. Thanks everyone.